and um, we now offer uh, more than uh, 20 uh, different subjects and essentially this is a, it's a very privileged way of getting educated and I would like to say educated uh, without having to pay fees and, and over a, a delicious uh, lunch because it, it enables me to sit together with, with um, leaders in the field ranging from law to, to sort of particle physics. And that is, 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 is really a, a very, very unique environment that we operate in. And I also enjoy having discussions with students, undergraduates, graduates, research fellows and fellows, and also alumni when they come. And I think this is an extraordinarily rich environment that, that uh, breeds uh, new ideas uh, and also uh, collaborations. And I personally uh, benefit hugely from that. And just putting on my, my development fellow hat briefly, uh, it, it's really something that I feel quite passionate about, that we should be able and should work very hard on, about to preserve this to future generations. Now, coming back uh, to, to what we want to achieve today, one of the things I think when we first started to think about what we want to do today is to actually really try to reflect this. We try to reflect the variety of research that is done in the college and research and research that teaching is really what we, what we are all about. And um, so hence what the master has just shown you is really giving you uh, today, we're giving you a, a snapshot of, of a number of research projects that are run in the college. But one of the things that I and we all felt very passionate about is as well that we create a platform where we give all of everyone in college, regardless of their state, state uh, grade, or, or uh, regardless of their stage in their career, they are a platform where they can present uh, their results and their research. And that is very well reflected in the first session here about the advances in medicine, where we essentially have the stage shared between the chief medical officer uh, of England and a postgraduate or a graduate uh, student from my lab uh, that share the stage together. And with that, I essentially go straight now into uh, the first session, uh, which is advances in medicine and the role of research. And I wanted to introduce you to the first speaker, spe uh, speaker which is Sir uh, Chris Whitty. And for most of you that have been in the UK during the pandemic, I think Chris Whitty is a very, very familiar face. What you might not have known is that Chris is, of course, a Pembrokean. So Chris enrolled in 1985, I hope I remember that correctly, in Pembroke. And has then, of course, since uh, had a, a very uh, stellar uh, career. And um, I try not to hash this up, uh, but amongst them, he served as the chief, uh, uh, chief scientific uh, officer uh, of uh, the chief scientific officer I knew, I knew I, I messed this up, but essentially there's a lot, yeah. there's a lot, there's a lot of chiefs and, and heads in there. Yes. Uh, and, and, and of course also he's the chief uh, medical officer of England. And um, what he also is, of course, he's, a, he's an honorary fellow of Pembroke. And it's, it's uh, absolutely extraordinary how much time he is giving uh, to Pembroke and is inspiring uh, the next generation of scientists and researchers. So with that, over to you, Chris. Thank you very much. Thanks. 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 Wonderful, thank you very much. Um, it's, it's, it's a real honor to be here with everyone. It's a fantastic program. Um, I'm going to try and do an overview of where we are in medicine. Uh, I'm trying to do all of medicine in 400 years in 25 minutes. So uh, hold on to your seats. I do uh, need, however, just to say one thing at the beginning. I had to get special permission to come and talk here in a pre-election period. And the agreement, and I had to persuade them that you can't postpone a 400th anniversary, which took some doing. But I did promise them that everyone would agree that anything couldn't be tweeted out or reported on until after 10, uh, 10 p.m. on Thursday. Not that I'm intending to say anything controversial politically, to be clear. So um, when Pembroke started, the uh, average uh, median age of mortality is around about 40. Uh, and as you can see, uh, for the first 200 years of Pembroke's existence, the medical profession took their fees and achieved almost nothing. Um, and uh, almost all the intellectual life actually in medicine was uh, among surgeons, slightly embarrassingly, because uh, we didn't actually uh, train surgeons in this uh, university. But we made up for it in the last 200 years. Uh, and the extraordinary improvement uh, in the UK and subsequently globally uh, in the uh, increase in the how long people lived, which is a doubling over the last 170 years, is one of the great triumphs 
uh, I would say, of humanity. Now, it's important to recognize that a lot of this came from medical and public health science, but much of it also came from other areas. E economic development, which rested on agriculture and, uh, and engineering in particular, uh, and also changes in attitudes, which came, many of which came from the humanities. So this is not a single uh, entity. But I'm going to talk about the medical science area. When Pembroke started, um, there were the first stirrings of intellectual life in medicine uh, in uh, England. But I, I have to be honest, uh, there, was a, there was a reason that William Harvey, who, who was writing around the time of the beginning of his college, got his training elsewhere. At that stage, Oxford was considered to have the most backward medical training in Europe. So a lot has improved and changed since that time. And there was relatively slow advances until about 1850. And since that time, the improvement in medical science has been absolutely uh, extraordinary, uh, coming out of basic science through to applied science, uh, but often in rather, uh, rather unpredictable ways, as I'll, co as I'll come on to. And the result of this is that medical science and associated sciences have undoubtedly completely transformed society. A hundred years ago, the demographic pyramid of this country was what you see on the left. Uh, very similar, in fact, to what you'd see in some of the poorest countries in, uh, in Africa today, um, but they are changing very rapidly as the UK has changed in the last century. And it will continue to change over the next, uh, the next 30 to 40 years. And fortunately, this is not just in the UK. Pembroke is an international uh, college, and in every country in the world not actively at war, the life expectancy has stunningly improved in the last 50 years. All of this is based on science. Not all medical science, but science of a whole variety of different types. This is, by any standard, remarkable. And the improvement, for example, in child mortality we're currently seeing in Africa is the fastest seen at any point in history. So this is going to continue, uh, uh, including in some of the uh, countries which are most uh, economically um, uh, rapidly but so rapidly advancing, but from a low base. Now I'm now going to talk a bit about the big three causes of mortality that we've had to date uh, in the UK and over the history of Pembroke College. And this is just taking the long view, this is, uh, but this is state going down to the last 100 years. In the dotted line, uh, infectious diseases. Infections still have the capacity to surprise us, as we found during the COVID pandemic, uh, as we found during HIV, which I'll come back to. But uh, when Pembroke started, mortality was almost, uh, almost overwhelmingly dominated by infectious diseases. And improvements in multiple areas of infectious diseases led to that dotted line coming down. So by about the 1950s, uh, outside people at the very uh, terminal, uh, older end of life, uh, and the very, very youngest, very few people died of infection. The solid line, cardiovascular diseases, peaked in the 1950s and 60s, at which point one in two people in the UK was dying of heart, heart, heart attacks or stroke. And that has steadily improved. We're now down to about one in four. I anticipate that will continue to improve for reasons I'll come on to. But that has been another remarkable recent advance. And then in the dashed line, cancer, but within cancer there's been a lot of movement. But that's sort of the broad view of what science has done uh, to health in this country. Let's start off with infectious diseases. So as I say, in the first 300 years of Pembroke's existence, infection really was dominant. And if you look at the bills of mortality from the period when Pembroke was founded, uh, they are overwhelmingly uh, people who died of infections of various sorts, uh, other than uh, women who died uh, in child childbirth, um, unfortunately. What has led to that? Well, this is the, one of the first general points I wanted to make. The range of sciences that has led to this improvement just within medicine is extraordinary. Probably the first big changes were in engineering. Uh, the, the provision of clean water and sewage was the first massive improvement and really allowed the growth of cities, including cities uh, of the size now of Oxford. Alongside that, the Green Revolution and then the Second Green Revolution subsequently have led to substantial improvements in diet, which is very important for uh, the outcomes of infections. In, in, in vector-borne diseases, 
like malaria, which I used to work on, we'll be hearing more about that in the next talk, sleeping sickness, which used to kill millions of, millions of people in Africa, uh, work on insect um, uh, sciences have had a very big impact. And then, of course, there's the clinical sciences, immunology, vaccines, which I'll talk about briefly, microbiology, um, study of bacteria in particular, virology and the viruses, uh, and pharmacology, diagnostic tests, multiple sciences that we would now recognize, but importantly, and often I overlooked, the social sciences. Much of what is important in health is actually about behavior and ability to understand and then to help people change behaviors is critical to improving health outcomes in a sustainable way. Now, uh, if there are any anti-vaxxers in the audience, look away now, because uh, I'm just going to do, just do a couple of slides on how amazing vaccine science is, because this is an area which is still progressing extremely rapidly uh, in science today. Some areas of science, uh, of science uh, go through pauses, others are moving very fast, vaccinology is one of them. Here are two relatively recent vaccines that have had their effect since I and many people, if you are doctors, and the, uh, doctors, nurses, or medical workers in the audience were at medical or nursing school, uh, rotavirus and uh, HIV. Uh, when I was training, Haemophilus influenzae caused significant amounts of uh, meningitis in children. Some of them died, some of them were left paralyzed or with significant neurological uh, disabilities. Virtually gone because of introduction subsequently of HIV vaccination. On the right, uh, rotavirus, major cause of death globally and significant uh, problems elsewhere. Uh, you can see when the vaccines were, you didn't really need the blue arrow to work out where it is that the vaccines were introduced to the UK system. And of course, most recently, uh, COVID, the triangle was the gradual, uh, above at the top, is the gradual rollout of the uh, COVID vaccine, a great triumph of organization by the NHS, but based on some outstanding science uh, from a variety of different uh, areas. And again, you can see these are the impacts uh, on mortality. So vaccinology, uh, one of the sciences that is still advancing. Um, uh, and what happened during um, COVID is that we had a very fast expansion in our understanding uh, and investment in vaccine science. And this is going to have implications, not just for infections, but as we'll hear, I think, in the next talk, uh, for, uh, for other areas uh, as well. Um, so we've had a, a lot of movement in vaccine science, and on the right here is a rather nice nature review that looks at all the new, the new vaccine types that came in as a result of COVID, which we can now use and repurpose for other diseases. Uh, many of them, we were very unsure of their effectiveness. Uh, antivirals have been moving forward very rapidly. For example, hepatitis C, a major cause of liver cancer, is now almost entirely treatable, which was not true 20 years ago. Uh, antibiotics are moving much more slowly. These are what, what kill uh, bacteria. And for that reason, we worry about antimicrobial resistance, which I think my predecessor, Dame Sally Davis, would kill me if I didn't say, big problem. Um, and alongside that, we've got tools against many parasites uh, and many vector-borne diseases, which are still major causes of disease in the tropics. And actually, with global warming and climate change, will become increasingly uh, prevalent, uh, like potentially uh, here in the UK. Moving on to um, cardiovascular disease, this is what has happened to um, uh, heart disease, and the same is true of stroke, the graphs are very, very similar, uh, since the uh, late 1960s. This is mortality in the UK. I think that is a quite astonishing achievement. And I think if you'd said to people 30 years ago, this is where we would be, very few people would have believed that was possible. Now, what has done this is not any breakthrough. And this is my second overall point. Science is an incremental process of small advances building on top of one another. It is not due to breakthrough things that you tend to read about on the front pages of the newspapers. If you read breakthrough, discount it. It's just a university press officer getting excited. And this is made up of broadly three kind of things. It's made up of primary prevention, things the government does, laws against smoking, uh, things to reduce air pollution, I'll come on to some of those. Secondary prevention, which is where you find somebody who's got a risk factor of early disease and you intervene to stop that disease progressing. Uh, and then treatment. And I'll give just a few examples of the science around these uh, next. So primary prevention. The two biggest drivers that have really changed since the 1960s are smoking and air pollution. 
Smoking has driven a very large amount of the cardiovascular disease we've seen in the UK. Reducing it has led to very remarkable uh, improvements. I'll come on to the speed of that in a second. But people underestimate air pollution. They think about air pollution as a lung problem. Actually, many more people are affected in terms of heart disease and strokes. So addressing air pollution, which is principally an engineering challenge, but driven by epidemiology, has led to very significant improvements in this, as with a number of other diseases. We still have a way to go, but uh, this is another area where the government, state medicine, has a part to play. And just to give you a sense of the scale of this, this is uh, the, the bar I put in the middle uh, is when the smoking ban in indoor places was brought in. And you can see the almost immediate effect of that on heart disease in just taking Liverpool as an example. An astonishing, astonishing drop immediately in heart attacks, which then continued to improve over many years following that. So these big primary preventions can have really dramatic effects in the short term and even more impressive effects uh, over the longer term. On to secondary prevention. And this is another demonstration that science goes in all sorts of weird directions. Uh, Secondary prevention is where you find someone with a risk factor and then you treat that risk factor so as to reduce their risk and slow down their disease, hopefully till after they're dead. That's the key. It's basically people are going to die, we're all going to die, there's nothing wrong with that. But what we want to do is have our disease after we're dead. So push it off to the right and this is what these diseases are aiming to achieve. And I'm just taking three of the drugs that are used just to show how science progresses. On the left, aspirin. Uh, came actually out of willow bark originally. Uh, widely used and for a variety of uses. Uh, its use in preventing strokes and heart attacks wasn't really fully recognized until the beginning of the 70s and then the evidence gradually accrued over periods of time. As I'll show you, it's also very important in treatment. Almost, it's an incredibly cheap drug, uh, came out of what we can we've now call traditional medicine. Second one are ACE inhibitors. This is a very important class of drugs that helps protect the heart particularly people who've got early heart failure uh, and will delay disease and disability in a very long way. This was first discovered after seeing what happened with uh, Brazilian pit vipers, the guys, the guys in the middle. They, uh, they invite their prey and the prey's blood pressure drops incredibly fast, that's why they die, but a little bit of the kind of same kind of approach leads to an improvement uh, in outcome. You call the basic science from rabbit dies when the, when the viper bites them through to people don't die when you actually uh, treat them with Captopril and various other Pril drugs, some of you will be on probably, uh, is a long one, but each step of it was important and the impact on health has been extraordinary. And on the right, a disease was, a, a, sorry, a, a drug that was actually designed from first principles uh, um, by uh, Back, got, rightly got the Nobel Prize for this, uh, noting that adrenaline drove the heart and therefore if you can slow down adrenaline effects, you will slow down the heart and that will be good for your heart. So these are just three examples of the strange paths that science takes to lead to these incremental but cumulatively enormous advances. And then treatment. And I'm just going to take two examples in cardiovascular disease. The first came out when I was a medical student here at Pembroke, a trial called the ISIS trial. At this point, remembering that the heart disease was the principal cause of death, uh, a single aspirin reduced death by about 20%. If you added another drug called streptokinase, which is the thing that breaks down clots, another roughly 20%. If you added them together, just under 40% reduction in mortality. Absolutely astonishing. And that's been built on since that time. But this is the power of trials to show that old drugs can have very big effects. This is, this is trial science. On the right, a very different kind of end of cardiovascular disease. Um, we have for a while now been dealing with heart attacks by putting in stents, where you go into the heart, uh, through a nick in the groin, uh, open up a blood vessel, put in a kind of bit of thing that looks like chicken wire, and come out again. Uh, it sounds simple, it's a little harder to do, but the end, both the science and, the, and the, the delivery of this is brilliant. What we're now doing is doing similar sorts of things with strokes. People come in with a stroke, you actually put something like a corkscrew into the clot, you remove the clot, and the brain just recovers. It's quite astonishing when you see it. Uh, and so these are some of the developments which require a combination of, phys of, of engineers, uh, epidemiologists and uh, clinicians uh, to advance them. Moving on to um, cancer, the third of the last areas, and this is the one which is going to move most quickly over the next 30 years in my view. 
This is unpublished data from Cancer Research UK, but I think it illustrates this quite nicely. On the left-hand end of these bars is where cancer survival was in the 1970s, and on the right-hand end of the bar is where cancer survival is today. And at the top of those are a variety of cancers, testicular cancer, melanoma, Hodgkin's prostate, breast, uterine, where actually the great majority of people who are diagnosed with cancer will now live uh, for 10 years or more, which again, for practical purposes, means they will live the rest of their life uh, without the effects of cancer being the dominant thing in it. At the bottom end of this are various uh, cancers we have not seen major improvements in treatment over time, uh, and the sad thing about many of them is they are largely or almost entirely preventable. The principal one being lung cancer, where over 70% is due to smoking, and quite a lot of the remainder is due to air pollution. Uh, still our leading cause of cancer death. Uh, but let's say stomach cancer, uh, brain, uh, not brain cancer, so um, uh, esophageal cancer, pancreatic cancer, there are well-known things you can do to reduce the risks of these. So these should be preventable even when they're not treatable. Um, <coughs> thinking about cancer prevention, the current estimates are about 40% of the cancers we currently see are preventable. So the question is, how then do we do them? Some of them are fairly basic things, smoking cessation, diet, obesity, alcohol, reductions, reductions clear, uh, and occupational exposures um, for some diseases, which are now have largely ceased, uh, some for melanoma. And then there's a large number of cancers which have historically been driven by infections. And we really are making huge inroads in preventing those, of which the most important is cervical cancer, which is a major cancer of young women, uh, it will, within two generations, be for practical purposes eliminated due to back vaccination by HPV, against HPV. But the same is true for some for major drivers of liver cancer, historic, historically and globally, uh, hepatitis B and hepatitis C, stomach cancer because it's caused by bacteria, largely caused by bacteria called H. pylori, which is now largely uh, disappeared. Stomach cancer used to be a huge problem in the UK, really relatively rare now. Then <clears throat> the next uh, group of sciences is around diagnostic improvements. And this is important because it, on the left here is the five-year survival for three major cancers uh, if they're caught in their earlier stage. And the survival on the right is if they're caught in their, li their latest stage. The treatment is far more successful, far less invasive, far less unpleasant if you can catch it early. So diagnosis is absolutely critical. Some of this is being done by biochemistry. Some of this is being done by histological things, what's called uh, liquid biopsies, blood tests, and variety. A lot is done by imaging. So, for example, we've seen big improvements in prostate cancer diagnosis because of use of MRI scans for men. In many cases, picking up a cancer that does not need treating. You know it's there. You don't need to treat it. That's a, that's a useful outcome. Screening uh, in breast cancer for women, for example. So improvements in diagnosis really make a very much different, very big difference, and they're often less appreciated, I think, in the public than uh, treatments. Actually, if you can pull diagnosis from the right-hand side of that graph to the left-hand side, you have a much bigger effect than if you uh, give someone a drug which might extend their life by three or four months. So diagnosis is critical. And then there's treatment. And broadly, I put in terms of the how early uh, they came in. Surgery for cancers is the oldest, but in a pre-anesthetic era, there was a limit to what you can do. I just think about that for a second. Uh, radiotherapy is surprisingly uh, early. We've had radiotherapy for 120 years now, uh, but always improving. Um, and the key improvement is that you can get closer and closer to the cancer, so you don't get radiotherapy around the other tissues. That's really the key advance that is still occurring. And chemotherapy, which is really now a relatively old uh, class of drugs, broadly, most of them were, were developed from multiple different routes, ranging from uh, observation about mustard gases to, uh, it, during the war through to pregnant, folate deficiencies in pregnancy in India, uh, multiple routes of science. But they're relatively old and destructive drugs. So we're now moving on to an era where I think the drugs will be as effective or more effective, but also have many fewer side effects. Uh, hormonal treatment, uh, already very important for breast cancer and prostate cancer. That is a, that's a, has really developed since certainly the 80s. Uh, but now what we're moving on, the big advances which are currently happening are antibody-based treatment. Quite a lot of them, for example, used in breast cancer already. 
uh, and uh, what are called small molecules, which are things which can get into cells and interfere with the uh, actual physiology of the cancer cell itself. And what I've shown here is this on the left is uh, 2001, on the right is 2020, the number of new cancer small molecules that have got FDA approval over that time is steadily increasing. So this area of small molecules, which usually have much fewer side effects than chem chemotherapy, uh, is moving at a very, very rapid pace. But the biggest group of uh, improvements actually are now in immune therapy. And this is where your own immune system, you are all producing cancer cells the whole time. You may not know it, but you are. Your immune system is finding them and killing them before they cause you problems. So the cancers that survive are the ones the immune system has ignored. And the big changes we've seen recently are in being able to take the breaks off the immune system and make the immune system hyperactive so it finds cancers that it had missed and starts to kill them uh, and make them uh, much smaller. This is going to advance, I think, very significantly in the next two decades and possibly alongside that cancer vaccines. Uh, I think we're feeling more confident about that now than we were uh, two or three years ago, partly due to advances in science we got during COVID. But it's important to be clear that improvements in all sciences, and cancers are no exception, uh, tend to occur incrementally. Uh, this is on the left of the 1970s, where the survival is, and on the right is where we got to by 2018, just pre-COVID. -pre and as you can see, you could put a ruler against that and guess where survival will be in 10 and 20 years, and you'll be roughly right. I haven't chosen these uh, deliberately. These are, I've just chosen two cancers, uh, as it happens, colon, colon cancer and melanoma, but I could have chosen many others. Science advances by small increments building on top of one another. That is something which I think is often not fully appreciated. But you don't go backwards in cancers. You don't go backwards in cardiovascular disease. Well, you can go backwards as in infections, because new infections come in and hit you unexpectedly, HIV, uh, COVID being two recent examples. And then <coughs> finally, um, uh, before I go on to just two areas where I think we're not doing so well, inflammatory diseases, very debilitating, things like rheumatoid arthritis, inflammatory bowel disease, here our uh, improvements are in interfering with the immune system in the opposite way to with cancers. Here we put the brakes on the immune system, but trying to make sure you make the bit of the immune system that's attacking you yourself damped right down without destroying the rest of the immune system, which is protecting you from infections, cancers, and much else besides. So the art of this is to actually put the brakes on in as narrow a way as you can to stop the disease without uh, leading to the immune system uh, failing for other reasons. And the rare genetic diseases. Each one of these is, is as the name implies, rare, but the number of people who got rare genetic diseases is actually very large. So their cumulative um, uh, effect on humans is very significant. And in many of these, particularly ones where there's a single gene problem, we now have a drug which can often completely or largely override that single gene issue. Uh, in other diseases, we've had a number of incremental advances. And the one I'm just going to uh, just highlight, because it's just an example, uh, is cystic fibrosis. The UK has one of the highest cystic fibrosis rates in the world. Uh, we, get, we are more likely than some gene diseases and less others, but the white British population is very prone to cystic fibrosis by global standards. Uh, survival in the 1930s, you were very unlikely to get to your fourth birthday. Now there are many people with cystic fibrosis living very full lives uh, up to their 40s and 50s and hopefully beyond. This advance is again advancing incrementally, uh, uh, but advancing the whole time. So where are we not going so well? Well, I think there are probably... Um, I'd just like to highlight two areas. There are some others. The first is mental health. We've had stunning improvements in our understanding of the brain, anatomy, physiology, biochemistry, imaging, multiple different areas. That has not translated into stunning improvements in mental health uh, treatment and indeed mental health prevention. Uh, and I think this is an area we need to uh, put a lot more effort into because it has lagged a long way behind the extraordinary changes we've seen in infections, cardiovascular, cancer, and inflammatory diseases, I've just shown. And then the second area um, that I think we collectively have to do better is uh, what is slightly pompously called multimorbidity. It means people having several diseases at once. The reality for most people is they either have 
no diseases or trivial diseases that don't interfere with their lives at all. And then they start to get lots of diseases in quite close succession. So most older patients have got three, four, five serious problems simultaneously, and they interact medically, but they also interact for them as an individual. And medical science is taught, uh, medicine is taught on individual diseases. Medical science tends to go bench to bedside with individual diseases, nice pathways of individual diseases. You'll go to a clinic that's a hypertension clinic or an eye clinic or a diabetes clinic. We need to get away from that. We've got to accept that actually most people have got multiple diseases that have got anything at all uh, and try to find the basis of that, delay it as much as we can, push off to the right, uh, and uh, then treat the cluster of diseases that an individual person has. Science, I think, has not caught up with that reality. Final point, and it's a cheerful point. On the top here um, is uh, where the most deprived um, populations in the UK uh, are in terms of their life expectancy, and in the orange bar is the number of years they live with ill health. As you can, the, the, uh, this line here is just quickly, so as you can see, people living in areas of deprivation, the ill health extends well into their working life, and they have many more years living with ill health, needing NHS care, needing social care, despite actually living a shorter period of time. So counterintuitively, doing the things that help people to have better quality of life will extend their life, but also shorten the number of years they need health care. I think most people assume that if we make people live longer, that automatically means they'll spend more time in ill health. What this demonstrates is biologically that is untrue. That assumption is untrue. If we can just get the people in the top bar down to the bottom bar, everybody's health will improve. The impact on the NHS, social care, would be very positive. The impact on social life for many people, family life, would be positive. And the impact on the wider economy would be positive. This move is really what we should be aiming to do. Shortening disease should be our principal aim. As a result of that, lives may lengthen, but the aim should be to have shorter periods of ill health rather than to worry about mortality as our principal endpoint at this stage in, our, in medical history. We've moved a long way from where we were in the beginning of Pembroke's time where essentially longevity was what should be aimed for. I think we now should be uh, aiming very firmly at quality of life. I'm now going to pass over to some proper science. Hello. Um, so that, that was a really interesting presentation. I, I sort of I can't help um, asking about your experiences during the pandemic, and if you don't have to answer if you don't want to. But um, just in the context of this presentation, was there anything um, that you, any knowledge that you drew on during the pandemic from your understanding of the, the history of medicine and, and the kind of things you've just presented there that helped guide you in any way during that um, during that crisis? Uh, and there's a very long answer to that, but the, answer, the short answer is uh, most of what you have to learn, you know from a pandemic, has to be historical because you, by definition, are dealing with a new disease. So you have to look back to what has happened previously in pandemics. I think that the two biggest things that I took right at the beginning, and I was, you know, I thought they, they, they sound simple, but they're not. The first of which is this will come to an end, driven by science. And you've got to get people to understand that we're going to have to do some very difficult things to begin with, but science will come to our rescue. And what we've got to do is hold the line till the science is basically ridden over the hill with the cavalry behind them. And in the middle of it, looking back, that looks an obvious point, but actually at the beginning of it, people don't see that. They see night without end. And seeing that, that actually we can and we will get on top of this, as we have with every other pandemic, uh, is pretty critical. The other thing you learn from history is that the response of the average person in the street, overwhelmingly, is to be positive and helpful to their neighbours. And that's a really key thing. And if you think about what, for example, undergraduates here at Pembroke did to restrict their lives, knowing that they were at very minimal risk, it is even particularly true in the pre, not before we understood long COVID, they did it to protect vulnerable people and older people. 
and that was an extraordinary bit of altruism. That is actually how people respond to emergencies. And people don't expect that, but actually that is the lived reality over time. So I think those are the two very, very headline ones. There's a lot, lot of things I learned from science, a lot of things I learned from people who dealt with previous pandemics uh, uh, through history. Uh, hi. Um, is it true that there's a lot less spent on women-specific disease research than men-specific disease research? Uh, it depends whether you talk to breast cancer now or prostate cancer U U UK. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I mean, I think it, the, the problem with this is what is m women and men sp specific research is actually very, very fuzzy. There are many diseases that are not, quotes women's diseases, unquote, but which are actually much more common in women, even though they can also occur in men. So I've always found these kinds of differentiation fairly unhelpful. What you really want to do is look at which of the areas where lack of spend is the reason that an area of science is not advancing. I would say that mental health, for example, is an example where that is definitely the case. There are other areas, for example, I'm, I'm, I'm deliberately choosing a neutral example, not on that, so I can make my point. I've always thought that spending yet more money on HIV vaccines is probably unlikely to help us very much. We spent a, because we spent a huge amount on it, we haven't got very far yet. I'm not convinced we're ever going to. So what we really, the real question I think is, is there an area which is actually underserved because we could be moving forward and we're not? There are certainly some areas which are specific to women where that is true. There are other areas where I think that the, uh, the, re the research funding is not the principal barrier. So I think that's, a, that, that's an honest answer, but I can give you the numbers behind that because I used to run the National Institute of Health Research and other things. Um, on the uh, question of air pollution, I just wondered uh, from the micro and the macro, um, uh, on the individual level, is there something that we can all do to try and... Um, you know, minimize the effect of air pollution on ourselves in our lives in the present moment? And then in the longer term, what is it that's going to really make big impact at the government level? Like, for instance, electric cars, is there going to be a natural reduction in air pollution because of that? Um, anything that you think is really important on a government level that should be done? Yeah, so, I mean, firstly, one of the reasons that you have to deal with, with air pollution as a societal level. It's protecting yourself as an individual from air pollution is very hard actually, particularly outdoor in air pollution. The one way you can make a difference to yourself individually is indoor air pollution. Uh, and you know, if you suffer severe asthma, for example, don't, however beautiful it is, install an internal wood burner when a bit of central heating will do. It's not a clever thing to do. Don't burn candles. Uh, and if you do, burn smokeless ones, etc. There are some things you can do in that space. But when you're out in St. Aldate's, there is nothing you can really do except maybe change what time of day you travel. That's about as far as you can go. That's, a, that's the reason why you have to take a society-wide approach to pollution. And in fact, why the general public have always supported this, right back to the 1230s here in the UK when the first anti-air pollution laws were, were conducted. And within that, uh, the big, I mean, certainly transport, particularly private transport is critical because that tends to be where people live and work. So um, moving over to um, batteries uh, or other, uh, other non-polluting forms of transport is going to be critical. Uh, it doesn't matter which types really, but you have to create them down. That doesn't deal with brakes and tires and things. There's a variety of engineering challenges we're going to have to deal with particularly tyres and brakes because to some extent, but there are some issues. Uh, agriculture has been overlooked. We could do a lot to reduce, and it's not, it's not, the, it's not the risk of the people in the agricultural area, but uh, secondary pollution from agriculture contributes very significantly over cities. And we could do a lot of things by quite simple changes to agricultural practice, uh, which would actually reduce air pollution in the cities. So I think there's a whole range of things we can do, and whoever wins the election after the, I, I wrote a whole report on it if you want to read it, 360 pages, beautifully illustrated, free to the, free to the user, uh, which I intend to put on the desks if whoever wins the election uh, on Thursday and say, oh, how's about it? Because I do think this, this is an area where there's quite a lot we could do. We have time for one more question. Uh, thanks, Professor Whitty. Can I ask, what do you think is the most important step change needed in global health to help prevent future pandemics? Thanks. I think there's a very, well, I don't think there's a single step change we're going to be able to do. I think the single technology we need most of is diagnostics, actually, because you don't know what you're going to get, but you always need diagnostics early on. 
The biggest cultural change we need is the interaction between humans and animals, because the vast majority of pandemics will arise from animals, either because of completely new to the world infection like COVID or HIV, or because of a reassortment where human disease has gone into animals and come back, like flu. So I think that interface is a really critical one. And biosecurity in that area, trying to stop things uh, where wild animals are coming into contact regularly with humans, those are all areas which I think make sense. But we should be, ser we should be, we should be realistic about this. We can do all of the things that the textbooks will tell you you should do. We're still going to get pandemics. And actually, a lot of it is about how do we respond to those pandemics? How quickly do we scale up our science? Those, those questions. And for all of those, what you really need is a good science base. And if you, you, know, if you look at the UK and global response to COVID, I would say one of the bits that we did pretty well, actually, was the science response. There were many things we didn't do so well, but that was a strong response. And that was the countries that were best at science did the best science response. No surprises there. So having a good science base you can flip over actually is the thing which will most quickly get us from huge societal destructive things like lockdowns through to a medical response, which is much less destructive like vaccines and drugs. Thank you very much, Chris, for a fantastic talk. Thank you. Source uh, genetic information. 
message and all of that is making it more sweeping. And this is a surprising piece of their theory. They're using it, I guess, in terms of paying for clothing, so they can have more places and they can make these offers. So it's a relatively conservative way of doing a very theory. It's also relatively cheap. Cheap, it's all relative, but it's relatively cheap. And, and, and you learn from it as you read it. But one of the big advantages that, that we are in the early years of the army uh, application has is what they're referring to here as the cargo. Is to give us this relatively easy task to insert the information that makes it a particular clothing. So I refer to this as the cargo layer of the RNA report. But the mechanical grammatical changes, so it's highly, highly elastic and packing, and you can do these very rapidly with the deliveries and the advice and the role of you know what the end result is, that counts for every unit sold, and you can relatively rapidly insert. It's a scale. The other one technology, uh, there's, there's hope that the same technology can be used for many, many more applications, including, for example, cell therapy, for example, for cancer uh, therapies. Uh, it can be used for multiple replacements, genetically, and in particular, in the, in the therapeutic landfill, for example, more for the landfill of Jack Bristol, which is also a very important place, and other ones can be used in treating cancer. Uh, there's ongoing work on all of this. But there's a big uh, uh, transition here now from using the technology in, in the vaccine space. Uh, successful to get into this additional space that provides uh, a huge amount of people uh, application in this technology. And what my lab works on is trying to bridge that, that gap and provide solutions <coughs> that en uh, enables us to use this technology in this uh, final battle. And Alex will be, will be able to talk to you about the particular one and try to make landfill that can uh, uh, get the greatest uh, yield area of cancer. And this brings me now to the introduction second speaker of today, and this is uh, Alex Welch. And you need to forgive me if I'm like Chris, you don't know his name. Uh, I know him very well because uh, he uh, joined Kendall in 2018 as a, uh, as a biochemistry undergraduate. Uh, and then finished his studies as a first class uh, degree and wants to apply um, RNA, uh, and RNA tutorials are obviously not, not his job because he decided to uh, stay on. Uh, thank you for the introduction, Andre. Um, I'm delighted to be here today to celebrate the 400th anniversary of Pembroke with all of you. And when Andre asked if I'd like to give this talk, he didn't mention I'd be following Chris Whitty, so uh, no pressure. Um, but today, I will be talking about using mRNA technology to deliver proteins that prevent malaria. And malaria is responsible for over half a million deaths each year, and it is caused by plasmodium parasites. The plasmodium falciparum parasite is the most deadly of these, and it is transferred to humans by the bite of an infected mosquito. And it first replicates inside the liver before being released into the bloodstream. And in the blood, it will invade the red blood cells. And it does this to hide from the immune system. And inside the blood cell, it replicates until a point where it bursts open that red blood cell. And these new parasites can then invade other blood cells. So we have this cycle, which actually causes the symptoms of the disease. And these blood stage parasites will also give rise to the male and female gametocytes, which will be then transferred to another mosquito to infect it, and therefore complete the life cycle of the parasite. And currently, there are two malaria vaccines that have been recommended for use by the World Health Organization. RTSS and R21. R21 is what is the Oxford malaria vaccine, which you might have heard about on the news. Um, and this has been a great advance for the field, but there's a challenge because these vaccines target the parasite before it enters the liver. So if a very small number of these parasites manage to make it to the blood stage, it will still cause the disease. 
And therefore, there is now considerable interest in developing next generation interventions that actually target the symptomatic stage, the blood stage. And it's hoped that we can use these interventions targeting the blood stage in combination with these other interventions targeting the earlier stages. And therefore, we target the parasite at different stages and hopefully we boost the overall efficacy. And within this blood stage, there is one critical event, which is the actual invasion of that red blood cell by the parasite. And this relies upon a particular protein of the parasite called RH5, and it's highlighted here. And this RH5 protein, it interacts with a receptor on the surface of that red blood cell, and it docks, and that leads then to the invasion. And this occurs very rapidly in a matter of seconds. So we can think of this as an Achilles heel of the parasite that we can target by blocking the interaction of RH5 with that receptor. And this is what the blood stage malaria vaccines aim to do. And the current leading blood stage malaria vaccine consists of this RH5 protein from the parasite. We can inject that in, and that will give rise to an immune response, which will generate neutralizing antibodies. And these can bind the RH5 protein on the parasite preventing that interaction with the receptor on the blood cell and blocking invasion, blocking the subsequent symptoms of the disease. And this is the work of Professor Simon Draper's lab here in Oxford. But this lab also discovered that in clinical trials of these vaccines, these RH5 proteins also give rise to antagonistic, unwanted antibodies that actually inhibit the action of the neutralizing antibodies. And also, it's a major challenge to reach high enough concentrations of these neutralizing antibodies. But from these trials, we have identified now one of the most potent anti-malarial antibodies, which is called R516. So an alternative strategy is to take this R516 antibody and directly inject that into patients, into humans. And when we do this, we have shown that this works in mice. In mice models of malaria, we can block the infection just by giving this R516 antibody. But there are some challenges with this, and that is, the antibodies are extremely expensive to make, and this is mainly due to extremely complex manufacturing. So we collaborated with the Draper Lab to develop a solution where we can deliver this antibody, but in a different way. And this is by using mRNA technology. So here, we give the body mRNA, which contains the blueprint to produce this anti-malarial antibody inside the body. And as we saw in the pandemic, there uh, were many advantages with this, such as the low cost, the less complex manufacturing, and also this platform, as Andre mentioned, is very rapidly adaptable. So, you might have seen in the news, there's now a lot of excitement about mRNA because it can be used in many different areas, such as in cancer vaccines. But there is a major challenge that faces the transition from using mRNA as a vaccine to using mRNA as a therapy. And that is because with a vaccine, only a very limited amount of protein is actually required in order to induce the immune response. But for a therapy, we now need to encode and deliver a much higher level of that protein because that protein actually causes the therapeutic effect. So we can think of this like a dial. We need to move that dial now to boost the level of protein that is produced from the mRNA. And in our case, this protein is the anti-malarial antibody, R516. So we first set out to develop an mRNA platform that maximizes the protein output from the mRNA. So we can make different mRNAs, we can add them into human cells, and once they're inside that cell, they can engage with the ribosome, as Andre introduced, which is machinery that can translate the mRNA into protein. And we make these mRNAs such that they encode a protein called luciferase, which can catalyze a reaction that leads to the generation of light. And we can measure this light output. So the light output correlates with how much protein we produce. And there's a key region on this mRNA, here highlighted on the left, called the 5' UTR. And that stands for the untranslated region. So it doesn't code for the information for the protein, but it has a major effect on how much protein is made. And this is because this region actually affects how efficiently that ribosome can translate the mRNA into protein. And on the other side of this molecule, we have the 3' UTR, and this primarily affects how stable that mRNA is. So if it's more stable, the mRNA will be present in the cell for longer, 
So it has more time for the ribosome to translate it into protein. So the combination of these two factors will decide how much protein is produced. So we selected particular sequences here that aim to boost both of these features to overall maximize the protein output. And we then wanted to compare how good these UTLs were with the current state of the art, which is used in the um, current vaccines. So we made the same mRNA, which makes the cyprase, but we replaced those UTLs now with those from a current mRNA vaccine. And when we made these different mRNAs and we added them into human cells, we saw that the Pergolab UTL combination actually outperforms the current market leader across three different amounts of mRNA inside the cells. And this led us to pattern these UTRs, and this now forms the foundation of our new mRNA platform. Another key part of the mRNA molecule is something called the poly-A tail. And you can see this here on the end of the mRNA. And this actually affects both the efficiency of translation, but also the stability of the mRNA. So we first make these mRNA with a very short poly -A tail, just a 30. We measure again the light output, and we see about 20,000 RLU. But then when we extend that poly -A tail out to 120, and we measure that output, we then see a large increase. So this really shows that the longer poly -A tails are critical to maximize the protein output from therapeutic mRNA. And other groups have shown this as well. But there is a major challenge associated with these long poly -A tails. And that's because for the short poly -A tails, they're technically feasible to make. But as I just showed, the protein output is limited. And we want to move to these longer poly -A tails, which have these high protein outputs, but they're much more technically challenging to make. So we really addressed this problem, and we developed a solution, and we're excited to announce we've also patented this. And this will also be used in combination with UCRs to help maximize the protein output. So now we have this mRNA platform. We then want to apply it to that problem I introduced earlier of malaria. So we can deliver this R516 anti-malarial antibody with the mRNA. So this shows the structure of the antibody. It's a symmetrical molecule. It's made up of a heavy chain and a light chain. The heavy chain, we can encode that on one mRNA. So this is the cargo, if you like. And then on the other mRNA, we have the light chain. And flanking the cargo, we have the UTR sequences, which we showed earlier are very effective at producing high levels of protein. And at the end of these molecules, we have the poly-A tails, which we are able to produce very long poly-A tails thanks to our second method. So we have these mRNAs that encode this antibody. We then want to test does this mRNA actually produce the correct antibody when we add it into human cells? And just as a reminder, this antibody, it binds to this RH5 protein to prevent that invasion process. So we can take that RH5 protein in green, we can cover a surface with that, and then we can add the antibodies produced, and we can measure, do we make this antibody using a technique called ELISA, which results in a color change if the correct antibody is made. And ELISA relies on the part of the antibody that binds the antigen, RH5, being correctly formed. And it also relies upon the other extreme end of the antibody being correctly formed. So this technique will measure how much of the full length antibody we produce, which is then capable of blocking that parasite. And this technique doesn't just say, do we make the antibody or not? We can also use it to very accurately calculate the concentration of antibody produced so we can benchmark our platform with other platforms. So when we did this, this shows the control just to validate the accuracy of the assay. When we have cells where we don't add the mRNA and we measure how much antibody we produce, we don't measure any as expected. But when we add in the mRNA which encodes this R516 antibody into human cells, we measure how much is produced, we actually see a very high concentration which is above 16 microgram per mil. And to give some context to this value, this now shows the upper limit achieved by a viral vector system which encodes that same antibody. So the viral vectors are considered the gold standard, as Andre introduced, for delivering therapeutic proteins to the body. And we're clearly above that line. 
and other people in the literature who have aimed to use mRNA to encode antibodies are also below this line. So this is very exciting in terms of the proof of concept, and we're now ready to take this project further by going into mice studies. So to go into mice, we have to formulate this mRNA inside a vehicle that will allow the mRNA to be delivered into the target cells without the mRNA being degraded. And this was a major challenge for the field for many years. And to do this, we use a machine called the Nano Assembler Ignite. And we and a few other labs in Oxford recently won funding for this machine. And we now have this here in Oxford. This machine uses microfluidic technology to mix the mRNA with particular lipids to form a lipid nanoparticle, which contains the mRNA. We can then inject this lipid nanoparticle into mice, and we can measure the antibody that's produced. How much do we get, again, with this technique, ELISA? But we can also take the blood from this mouse, and we can test how effective the antibody is at preventing the parasite from invading the blood cells. So we can test the functional activity of the antibody. And we're very excited to soon begin the mice studies and keep hopefully progressing this project into the clinic at the end of the day. So I'd like to thank the members of the Ferger Lab, the Draper Lab, and in particular, the Oxford Percival Stanion Graduate Scholarship in Biochemistry for making this possible. And I'm very happy to take any questions. Alex, that was a, a beautiful talk, really showing the complex steps needed to do something like this. One step further, I guess you will want to target the cells that actually produce antibodies in the body, the B cells. Uh, or can, it be, can these antibodies be made anywhere? If yeah. you want to target the B cells, how will you do that? Yeah, so you're right. So normally in a conventional immune response, you have a vaccine. That would lead to the B cells then producing the antibodies. And they're very specialist cells that are very good at secreting high levels of antibodies. But with the mRNA technique here, we are actually not targeting B cells. So with this LNP, the lipid nanoparticle, if you inject that intravenously, most of that will be delivered to the liver. And the liver is also very good at secreting high levels of protein. And this is really key because we show here that you don't need B cells to produce antibodies because this is a HEC 293T cell. So it's um, a different, just general human cell model. It's not specialized to produce antibodies, but we produce these at very high levels. And um, so we won't be targeting B cells, we'll be targeting the liver uh, primarily. Excellent talk, thank you. Um, just one question. Obviously, you've shown now that you're able to make much higher concentrations than with the viral vector technique. Yeah. Um, is there any disadvantage to producing too high, uh, or rather injecting too high uh, concentrations, or is the more the better? Um, so because the invasion of the parasite is such a rapid process, we really need a very high concentration of that antibody to be able to block the parasite. So at the moment, it's thought the more the better. There is an issue about if you get a mismatch of how much heavy chain and how much light chain you have, because the, if you have too much of the light chain, they can actually aggregate and cause a disease with light chain amyloidosis. So there are some concerns about the sort of level between the two, but as long as we have the same ratio of the two chains, the more is considered better. Hi, what can you say about the characteristics of the nanoparticle? What can you say about that? Yeah, so, so the lipid nanoparticle, that was really a major advance for the vaccines, because without that, we wouldn't have had the COVID-19 mRNA vaccines. Um, for a long time, mRNA had a lot of hype, but we just couldn't deliver it to the body, because as Andre mentioned, mRNA is very unstable. There are many enzymes in the body called RNAs that are designed to kill off RNA viruses. They will also destroy the mRNA that's injected. So it has to be protected inside this lipid vehicle. Um, and the formulation of that is very precise, so it's made up of different types of lipids. One of those is an ionizable lipid. So when you inject that lipid nanoparticle, it has a neutral charge, and that's important for avoiding toxicity. But once it enters the target cells, when it goes inside the cell, it gradually um, becomes more acidic. So the charge of the ionizable lipid becomes more positive, and that allows the mRNA inside the lipid nanoparticle to then disrupt the membrane inside the cell and be released into the cytoplasm. And it also has cholesterol inside the lipid um, mix to help stabilize it, and also a pegylated lipid normally. 
Um, but the formulation of the lipid nanoparticle is really a major area of development at the moment. And as you mentioned about targeting cells, that's really the next step is for these different um, sort of therapeutic approaches. Um, one of the key areas is also looking at using mRNA to do gene editing. So delivering mRNA, which encodes the CRISPR-Cas9 system, for example. Um, and that might be able to use them to gene edit particular cells. We have to then deliver that mRNA to the right cell. And one of the ways that we can do that is we can actually use a similar thing to the anti malarial antibody, but just use a different antibody which targets a particular protein on a defined cell type. And we can conjugate that antibody to the lipid nanoparticle. And that way we can target where the lipid nanoparticle actually goes inside the body. And that's recently been tested and shown that you can do CAR T cell therapy in vivo using antibody conjugated lipid nanoparticles containing mRNA. So that's really exciting for the future. Thank you. That was a brilliantly clear talk on something very complex. And I wouldn't want to be tested on it right now, but um, it was very compelling. I'm interested in R516 and whether it is relevant for all malarial types and given potential rates of mutation in falciparum, whether it's likely to continue to be so. It sounded very promising that it's quite easy to alter those chains, um, but what are the technical hurdles to that and the cost hurdles to that? And, um, and also timeline for likely potential deployment um, in humans all being well. Yeah, so um, this R516 antibody, it is specific for the RH5 protein on the parasite, Dfalciparum. Um, just want to get this up. So um, this RH5 protein, that is for the uh, Pyclodium falciparum species, but there are other species such as Pyclodium vivax, which also causes a, a large number of deaths. Um, they also have similar proteins on their surface that are essential for the invasion process. So for Plasmodium vivax, it's the Duffy binding protein. And we also, the Drape Lab, have identified antibodies that bind to the Duffy binding protein, for example. So we could use the same concept using mRNA to deliver an antibody that binds that essential protein on the parasite that it needs to invade the blood cell. Um, and yes, so in terms of um, the timeline, um, we hope to go into the mice testing um, within this year. And we really want to then look at how durable this response is as well, because a key thing with the mRNA is the time that it actually makes the protein is fairly limited. So it really depends on that very high initial pulse of protein. And then we need to make sure that antibody is very stable in the blood to ensure that it's a durable response. And we can increase that by engineering particular parts of the antibody, um, such as the, the FC region, which is the long part below where the antigen binding site is. We can make mutations that increase the half-life in the serum. Um, so that will be really important for this approach. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, Alex, excellent yeah. talk. Um, a high-level question for you, maybe for uh, Andre as well. Um, and a, a chance to maybe address it while you have Sir Chris Whitty in the room as well. Uh, what is holding you back, and particularly with respect to money sitting here, whether it's Pembroke, Oxford, the broader environment, um, what would enable you to move faster and to compete with uh, everything that's out there in particular, particularly countries and places where there's, there's a lot of capital available? Yes. Yeah, so. Um one of the things that was holding us back was the ability to go into the mice testing, and that was because we really need that machine, the Ignite, and that is over £100,000. Um, but as I just mentioned, we were very happy to secure that funding, so we're now able to do that. So in terms of the timeline for this project, um, we're not really facing any major hurdles right now, um, but we would like to be able to increase the capacity of the research and, and have more manpower to test different RNAs to see if we can boost the antibody levels higher. Um, so. Um, with these patents, we're very excited to see where that will go, and um, you might have the option to also um, go beyond the lab uh, in other areas. But the funding um, is not so much an issue at the moment, and we're also very grateful for the Oxford Percival Stanion Scholarship, which funded my PhD, and that, and that enabled Andre to go into a new area of research, um, which is the mRNA therapeutics. Yes, if I, might, if I may add, uh, in my position, yeah, the more the more the, more the merrier, quite frankly. I mean, <laughs> uh, th th there's always there's always you know more money is always better because you, you can you can get more people into it. So Alex is a fantastic and a hugely talented individual. There's only so much he can do. So we now have a platform, and what we would want to do is really now expand into various different areas. So 
it's not just the anti-malarial antibody, but we have other projects that are at the moment on, on, on the baseline. Uh, and one, one of the, the, the things that would really accelerate these type of things is, is the speed that you, fund, that you get funding. So, so when, you, when I write a grant, it takes a rather long time for that grant to be assessed, and rightly so, it should be competitively assessed. Uh, but until you get the money, that there's a real lag phase. And then normally we kind of do this in a way that we plan this, but because this was something I started from new, that was quite difficult to do. So if you start, want to start something from new, it's very hard to actually get initial startup cash. And I was very lucky enough to, to actually have this uh, personal understanding scholarship, which is assigned to the biochemistry fellow in Pembroke. Uh, in perpetuity, I have a PhD student with some consumer, but that allows me really to swing into, into areas that, that um, otherwise I would have to write a grant or, or get some money from some, somewhere else to actually kickstart the whole thing. And that, that is a bit of a problem, I think. Uh, and afterwards, I mean, yes, I mean, the more money I get now, the, the, the better that we can move this, move, 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 move this on. Um, but, uh, yeah, as I said, very, very lucky with, with the um, Oxford uh, Personal Standing Scholarship. And it, it also means, you know, if I get under the bus, the next biochemistry fellow has, has again, the, 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 you know, the privilege to, to, to have this fantastic funding available. Yeah. Quick one, I guess, yeah. Pardon? Do you, you want to answer? You? Yeah, so, um, so we have the machine now. We can make the mRNA that we need. We just need to figure out the formulation exactly of the lipids to make the right lipid nanoparticles for this application. Um, but there are some standard formulations that we can just use straight away. And we can go into mice. And we're working with the Draper lab. And they've won awards for animal welfare. So that's really important to us as well that when we do these mice studies, it's all done in the right way. Um, and they have great expertise in that. And we want to then follow these mice over a long period of time to see how long the antibody levels last. And then based on that, we might be able to redesign some aspects to improve the output even further. Well, thank you very much. So all that needs to be done now is thank you uh, to both speakers, Chris and um, Alex, absolutely fantastic uh, performance. And thank you to the audience. And um, there's many more interesting things to go and listen to. Thank you very much.